But um, anyway, we're nearly there, but tonight, today is going to be a great day, actually. Two brilliant events to finish off the festival. Obviously, uh, if anyone still has the energy, there's the Bowie Raw gig tonight in Wheelands with Jerry Leonard, Shabsy, Peter Quinn, Brian Brody, and guests. Uh, I think Jerry is playing on about 20 songs tonight, so uh, you're in for a right treat there. So, um, yeah, it's great. Jerry's brilliant. He just gets right into the thick of things, so it's brilliant. But um, I just like, without further ado, because she has a flight to catch at 25 past seven. Um, so we might organise a guard and motorcade up to, up to the airport for you. But um, Leah Cardos from Australia lives in England. Uh, she runs the Tony Visconti Foundation or studio studio in Kingston University, just outside London. And uh, she's also the author of the amazing Black Star Theory book, which of course deals with Bowie's last years. So. Um, I haven't seen this audiovisual presentation, really looking forward to just sitting down. I might even sit by the fire just to kind of remind myself of home, which I haven't seen in six days. But uh, anyway, here she is, Miss Leah Carlos. Give her a big hand. quite nervous actually. Um, so yes, um, I wrote a book about the last works, so everything from the surprise announcement of his comeback uh, on his birthday in 2013, all the way up to the other surprise that bookends his last works, which is the announcement two days after his 69th birthday that he had died, and two days after the release of Black Star that he had died, and everything in between there I was very fascinated about. And I was thinking, um, how can I talk about it for an hour with you when there's just so much there and uh, so much juicy, quite academic at times, quite philosophical at times, quite musicological at times, things I can talk about. So I've chosen to just hone in on a theme. Um, so this is just following a theme and a thread of references as opposed to me kind of just selling my book to you and I hope that's okay with you today. And I wanted to focus on this idea of dreamers and dreaming as a presence in Bowie's work and particularly in the last works. Um, these images of Bowie looking at himself in reflection, images of Bowie referencing himself from the past and looking towards the future. Um, and representing also dream characters and archetypes is what we're going to look at today. I just want to say as well, that um, my book is primarily a musicological analysis thing. And um, I have been making these YouTube videos sort of explaining the analyses, um, which I'm not doing today. So I just hope that people aren't expecting me to like do a deep dive analysis thing, um, just simply because I didn't want to do a music theory thing today. I wanted to do something a little bit more accessible. But the three works that I'm looking at are um, The Next Day, Lazarus the Musical, and Black Star. Um, yeah, so let's get into it. The way that I was inspired to attack this was something that it was a clue from this wonderful design by Jonathan Barnbrook where ideas and lyrics are positioned as sort of hidden. If anyone here has the Black Star vinyl, you know what I'm talking about, how there's this black ink on black and you have to hold it up to the light to see it. But when you do, um, on this particular page, what you see is um, a constellation of ideas. And the, this sort of thing where positions and references and words and music and shadows and characters and books and movies and teleplays and pantomime, these are all sort of clustered. And I think my analysis was uh, sort of looking at sort of how are these all sort of meaningful together as a cluster and how can we sort of see how they relate. So taking cue from that, I made this not so beautiful, I'm not quite Jonathan Barnbrook, but this was sort of the themes of the book as they sort of emerged for me. And so the very big ideas that sort of come popping up all the time in Bowie's work at the end of his life. Particularly like this year, interestingly, and Carl Jung and um, the Bardo Thadol. It's interesting. The Man Who Fell to Earth, the year 1975, the idea of Buddhism. But dreaming and dreaming as theatre, I think is really important. So that's where we're going to begin. And um, what I'm talking about today is this idea of a theatre of dreams. 
we have two quotes here. The first one is from Jung. We meet ourselves time and time again in a thousand disguises on the path of life. And then Bowie says, I suspect that dreams are an integral part of existence with far more use for us than we've made of them, really. I'm quite Jungian about that. Does anyone recognise what this image is over here? I feel like I'm really in lecturer mode here, sorry. <laughs> I am a music teacher. <laughs> this is the painting uh, from the Red Book, which is uh, Jung's own dream journal from around the time of the First World War, on the cusp of the First World War. And it's a representation of the self, and of course the self are all these characters, um, the multiple eyes at the centre of it all. And so this is something that Bowie has looked at a little bit in his work before, just to remind you. <laughs> there is another detective, dream detective piece, one outside, I don't hope you're familiar with. Um, and this idea is psychological noir, this thing where in your dream there is a murderer or a crime and something has to happen inside your psyche to solve it and from the solving of it comes healing. And so what we have is this idea in the outside is we have Bowie as himself and he murders himself and he investigates his own murder through a cut up, right? Um, in Lazarus, what we have is a, is a shadow figure. Uh, we have the blurring of Bowie and Newton together. We have an anima and an animus. We've got all these characters that are part of dream worlds, which I think is interesting. And a few little quotes there. I'm an actor, I play roles, fragments of myself. He said that in 72, a few years later, I'm Piro, I'm every man. What I'm doing is theater and only theater. So from these cues, I wanted to dig into some of these themes of dream theater, not the band, <laughs> dream theater in the sense of Bowie's, Bowie's words. Um, and yeah, with these references, I think what it does, so just talking about it as a clever academic thing, what it actually does is it draws attention to the multiplicity of identity. And it also enacts a final healing for the David Bowie persona, the storyline of David Bowie, which I think is really quite generous of him. Okay, so here's the first clip we get to play. Um, so before he found fame as a musician, uh, David Bowie tried his hand at miming and <laughs> joined a theatre troupe with Lindsay Kemp. Um, it was uh, at the Dance Theatre in Covent Garden. This show was called Piro in Turquoise and it was staged in 1967 at Oxford but it was filmed for Scottish TV and broadcast in 1970. In this clip what we see is uh, Piro in a mirror world which he steps into, um, following love and his desire, uh, ends up getting jealous, murdering and sort of going a bit mad. So we get to watch that clip. Um, and have a look at the uh, outfit he's wearing as well. Interesting. Of course, the looking glass murders idea is something that relates, I think, to one outside also. This idea of this sort of murders going on beyond the looking glass. Now, um, just to talk a little bit about this unique costume. It was designed by Natasha Kulinov, who also designed, a sort of hidden, but you know, you know the one, the one down here, from Ashes to Ashes. And it also appeared in 1969 on the back cover, sort of, of Space Oddity, um, which was illustrated by George Underwood here. And I suppose what that speaks to is just that the character of Puro is something that Bobby latched onto and identified with in his songwriting, particularly the everyman's ability to be a fool and to be susceptible to violence and emotion and to be uh, capable of evil is something that he plays with definitely there. Um, the next time we see that costume is in 2013 for the video of Love is Lost. And before I play it, I just want to talk about it a little bit. Um, this is the remix version. Um, and it's the fifth single from the next day. And um, it was made by Bowie alone for the cost of, I think, a USB stick that it took him to transfer the information from his ca ca camera to the hard drive. It was done in the Isola offices with these marionettes that he had from the past. Um, in it, Bowie observes two of his character creations from the past. There's a puppet of the Thin White Duke 
and there's a puppet of Pura from the Ashes to Ashes video. They are engaged in some kind of back and forth. There's lots of guilt. One of them seems to be quite scary and accusing. One seems to be quite afraid but could be hiding their malice. So it's really interesting sort of study of Bowie, sort of also in the background washing his hands like Lady Macbeth. Anyway, let's look at a bit of this. that look at the end of that last character. Um, so last, Love is Lost was included in the uh, musical of Lazarus. Lazarus. Has everyone seen it? Has anyone not seen Lazarus the musical? I may or may not be playing a few clips from the movie version today for you. Um, but Love is Lost is one of the four The Next Day tracks that are used in the musical, and all of them are notably sung by this character called Valentine, who is a shadow character. Um, and there's something interesting about this. I was talking to Henry Hay, who was telling me that when he was doing the arrangement of Love is Lost, he insisted on this sort of pantomime style, dun, 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 at the start, dun, dun, dun. It's the first time you see the character, and he's clearly highlighted as the evil villain as he comes in. What's it like to feel that much love for someone and to be loved back? Okay, hopefully they won't sue me for this. <laughs> <laughs> was, yeah. um, so this brings me around now in my thread to um, the character of Thomas Jerome Newton, the book The Man Who Fell to Earth by Walter Tevis, the movie adaptation by Nicholas Roeg, The Man Who Fell to Earth. Um, I suppose this is important to note that David Bowie had the starring role, we all know this, we're not basic Bowie fans. Um, but what is useful to note is that 1976, is a time and a place that is very important at the end of Bowie's career. Obviously, Lazarus the musical, obviously also the evocation of the Shapiro portraits as well in the video to Lazarus. So it's interesting to look at that connection. And what we can see here is, I suppose, a site of convergence where the character of David Bowie is entangled with that of the character of Thomas Jerome Newton. Um, so we have, you know, the story of Newton being sent to Earth to find a way to transport water back to his home planet. Um, he fails the mission. His hero quest is unfulfilled. It's finished. It's left in limbo. There's no finishing to his story. The last time we see him, he's blinded, living in Manhattan, getting drunk. Um, and that's where we, pre we presume he is. He's also evoked in the song, which I love, uh, Goodbye Mr. Ed. <laughs> so Icarus is pratful and he's stuck somewhere in Manhattan. And so the musical picks up that piece and finishes it, finishes its hero quest, but does it in the psychological realm, in the dream realm, which I think is interesting. And I've got these pictures up here just to kind of remind us um, that Bowie really didn't shake Newton from his system, or at least not for a while. Um, during the shooting, uh, Rogue told Time Out magazine in 2011 that he was brilliant, he was just he was the alien on set. He, did, had no, he didn't need any direction. He was just being himself. And then afterwards, um, he identified so much with the, uh, the troubled and tragic character. He tried to make the music of the soundtrack. He also used photos from the set for Low, his next two albums, sorry, Station to Station and Low. And also those two albums of Bowie's, I suppose, could be said to be the, the two albums most associated with Bowie's lowest points in the 70s, his issues with mental health, his issues with psychic isolation, his, um, his issues with drug dependency. And so we have this moment that I think is quite powerful, um, and I suppose Bowie kind of brings that back at the end. Um, and he gives that character a type of redemption. Also, what's beautiful about Lazarus, if you haven't seen it yet, I just think it's such a poetic piece because in such Bowie fashion, what he does is he says, well, it's a fictional thing. This is about the man who fell to earth. But it's also all Bowie songs. Uh, it's also 
meant to make you think of him. He's up in a penthouse in Manhattan. There's a 14-year-old girl there. Um, there's rocket ships. There's all these sorts of things, these parts where you think you're meant to think he's Bowie, but you're also meant to not think he's Bowie. There's a deliberate blurring going on, which I think is very Bowie-esque and really elegant. Um, right, let's move on. Okay, so the musical was co-written with Enda Walsh, who um, apparently did a really great interview at this festival a few years ago. And bits from that interview I used a lot in my book because I think he might have said too much in that interview and there were some really good bits that I could use. Um, so, Ender Walsh was the one that let out that this was a morphine dream. Okay, so when we see uh, Thomas on the floor at the start of Lazarus, he's in pajamas, he's asleep, there's a blanket over him. At the end of the show, He's in that same position uh, and achieves his peace. So the idea that everything that happens is perhaps a before-death dream is kind of confirmed um, in the interviews where he said such. Um, he made a reference as well to and the singing detective. Um, so we're going to just have a look at a little bit of that stuff next. Um, the singing detective is this program that um, was cited as a reference for Lazarus, so I went back to it and watched it and found it very interesting. Um, again, who's, who here is familiar with this television show? A few of you. It's really well worth a watch. Um, I won't try and spoil it for you, but basically the structure of the narrative is that we have a, we have a person over here who is undergoing treatment in hospital and also writing a detective novel in their head. Um, the detective is solving psychological issues. Um, about their past, this is him as a child, figuring out what went wrong, what was true, what isn't. And then, because he's on drugs, he hallucinates these song and dance uh, sequences. And so these are the doctors treating him, uh, doing all of these sort of wild cabaret style um, music numbers. Which kind of makes sense of the way that Lazarus was put together. But then as I was watching it, um, I came across episode two, which is called Heat. And then that made me think, oh, that song Heat from the next day. Maybe there's a link there. So I thought I'd just show you a little clip from that. When I grow up, I'm going to be a detective. Just a battle, but he's more or less asleep now. Everything's under control. You have a right to call me, but he'll seek man for quite a while. Forget something, just leave him be, all right? I found it very instructing, this is a beautiful scene, but I found it very instructing watching back over this series, knowing that um, Bowie was inspired by it and was talking with Ender about it as a reference for Lazarus, but I can also, I don't know, um, it enriches a reading of uh, the finale track from the next day for me, uh, in, in the lyric interpretation anyway. Right, um, the other one that he, uh, Al Ender Walsh, name-checked in that Financial Times article was All That Jazz, um, which uh, he explained. So in the quote, he says, um, he was explaining how Lazarus was being developed, and he said that the two of them, Bowie and he, began to talk about death and how the brain would wrestle with itself or what it would see in the moments before death. And then Bowie said, according to Ender, can we structure something about that? So according to Walsh, Dana Potter's The Singing Detective obviously was an important reference that influenced the ideas about the song and dance and the structure and this, you know, the unconscious, subconscious and conscious levels of the storytelling going on. Um, in the same interview though, he name checks this and so I thought we'd treat ourselves to this wonderful scene uh, at the end of the film. Um, let's, let's check it out. Maybe I have to play it, hit the button one more time. Bye, yes. Bye, bye, Everything about it is appealing. Everything Just an astonishing sequence. Um, so obviously he gets to hallucinate a final show where he says goodbye to everyone that he loves. He gets to... Uh, yeah, anyone who's significant in his life, he gets to, you know, say goodbye to them, which I think is quite a significant point here. And also the staginess of it, also the fact that it's musical, also the fact that it happens live. It's not an album that you play, it's not a movie that you watch. In the case of Lazarus, it's something that happens and is enacted every night when it's played, which I think is really interesting as well. Let's have a look at this 
a little bit of a clip from Life on Mars from Lazarus. Found, but the film is a sad newborn, for she's growing tender. Okay, so um, he's trapped in his apartment. He's sick. He can't get out. Um, he's high, he's hallucinating, he's drinking a lot and he has a visitation by a girl who um, reminds him of his own daughter and then she hatches a plan to get him to go back to space, back to Anthea and it's a rocket ship in the, spa in the shape of a sort of taped out space on the ground, which is the space that he was lying in at the start of the musical and of course throughout the very confusing very dense, very angry, quite violent, quite funny musical. Um, he has to encounter his shadow, he has to deal with resentment, he has to confront um, some of the causes of his addiction, and he has to also let go of attachment uh, to his daughter figure. Um, and once he does that, he can be at peace, and he uh, gets to fly off in his rocket, which, if you notice, looks like a, a coffin shape on the ground. So it's really quite heavy, but it's also quite elegant and quite beautiful as well. Um, right, so, let's have a look at this, just a little bit of it. The, the edit there in Donnie's solo just really annoys me in that video. I wish there was a longer video with the full solo in it. Um, but obviously what we're seeing is, again, just a parallel with the sort of sickbed theme of somebody who um, perhaps is dreaming. Um, we've got the Buttons for Eyes, which is sort of a carryover from the Black Star video. I don't think I have the time and space to really go into that um, part of it, but there's, in my book I do write about it all at length. There's such rich connections that are there that do things, uh, which I find really interesting. But I'm going to just go over here and just talk about this for a second. Um, so when the music video came out, any Bowie fan who was a real Bowie fan clocked this one straight away. Um, the stripy uh, outfit um, being a direct reference to this iconic outfit that was from this, the Steve Shapiro sessions from uh, 1975. And, um, but also there are other echoes. So obviously there's the Kresos Kuros pose, um, which you're standing with one foot in the other with uh, the hands as a fist, which was also copied on the Tin Machine 2 album, a great album by the way, I love that album so much. Um, and so that was interesting, and when, you know, people were saying, what are those lines, what do they represent? And some people were saying, you know, oh, it means nothing, what are you doing, stop trying to read into it so much. I'm like, I'm a musicologist, I need to know. Um, and then some people were saying they were like um, silver cords, so for astral travellers, these cords that perhaps wrap around the body of the astral traveller so that they can be tethered somewhere. But the thing that was really interesting was that this came out um, when the Bowie Is exhibition went to Brooklyn. Um, all these extra black star bits joined the exhibition and there was this picture as part of the notes, uh, the Somnambulist for Lazarus video, and what I found interesting about it uh, was this rocket figure here, which is very similar to the rocket that you see in Lazarus, the musical. But we see the stripes again, and the Somnambulist gives it away. This is a sleepwalker. This is someone who's dreaming, or in a dreaming state. So when we go back to the video, we could look at it. This is a, a sleepwalker or someone who's dr in, in the dream realm. But also, the stripes also link to Cesare, um, from the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, which is one of his favourite films. So we're just going to watch a little scene of this. And you'll notice that um, when he comes out, he's got these dusted lines across the front of his costume. I suppose it's a silent movie, I can actually talk over it. <laughs> so, Ces Cesare is the somnambulist who is um, brought out to make prophecies, predict the future, Usually there's dark portent. Okay, they were very slow back then with these movies, so I'm going <laughs> to move on. You get the idea. But there's also a little bit of um, the movement as well, the sort of stiff movement as well. I think that it cross-pollinates, even if it... 
I'm not here saying that this meant this and here he's thinking of that and blah, but what I'm thinking is just as a cluster, there's a, there's a constellation of things, they're next, they're near to each other, it's interesting. And the proximities do, do something, you know, the fact that this is, you know, tangentially connected to that changes the context of this and it makes it more deep, more colourful, makes it more complex. And that's the kind of thing I'm talking about here. Um, also, just thinking back to German expressionism, um, I'm pretty convinced, I'm, I'm fairly convinced that um, Johann Rink was very influenced by um, the design of some of this stuff. Just looking at stills from the Black Star video against stills from uh, the films of <laughs> Robert Fiena Fritz Lang, and also the, the differently tinted nitrate uh, prints, the sort of the teal, the ochre, that sort of thing. Um, and on my YouTube videos where I've pointed this out, some wonderful people have like even added more evidence in the comments, like, yeah, but look at this, this is another one. I'm like, yes, maybe we should write a book about that as well. I want to go over to Dennis Potter again, because even though Ender Walsh didn't mention karaoke and cold Lazarus, when I was looking at all this stuff, and then I heard about Potter's swan song, and that it was called Cold Lazarus, I was like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> A link there and also the fact that he had devised these pieces to be work that lives beyond him so he wrote the screenplays to cold uh, karaoke and cold lazarus as he was dying of cancer knowing that that would be staged and broadcast after he died he also made all these stipulations he wanted bbc to do karaoke he wanted channel 4 to do Cold Lazarus. The story itself, if anyone hasn't seen it, is quite bonkers, but it's about an author who is also dying, so it's all very meta, all sort of wrapped up in itself. And as he's dying, at the end of karaoke, he decides to uh, freeze his head cryogenically so that perhaps in the future his illness might um, be curable, even though he doesn't have a body, I don't know how that would work. Um, and so Cold Lazarus comes out in the future, you know, hundreds of years in the future, um, and I could talk more about it, but I'll just be using up too much time. I think you guys are getting the point of where I'm going with this. Um, but Cold Lazarus was a way for Dennis Potter to conspicuous, conspicuously bring his death into his art, and his death completes and makes the art work, and also a kind of way to be immortal, way to live beyond his death and make sure his art speaks and works beyond his death. And so that cold Lazarus trick is, in my mind, it feels quite similar to the Lazarus trick that Bowie did with his work. And so I thought we'd just spend a little minute looking at Dennis Potter and what he did and how he did it in that regard. So this is the scene. I'm spoiling it, I suppose. This is the end of cold Lazarus. If you don't know how it ends, I'm letting you know now. So, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'm going to go back and just explain because it's really weird. Um, so basically, um, his head is kept alive in a fridge sort of thing um, and mined for memories, genuine memories. And it's the memories that the future people are really interested in. And they show up on this weird wibbly wobbly screen. Um, and emotions and stuff like that. And it turns out that he's really just wanting to die. So at this point, he's like, please kill me. <laughs> please put me out of my misery. And uh, yeah, so, so now you know the context. Um, Dennis Potter dramatised his death like that um, in the future, so many years after his death, but also the fact that his life folding in upon the white light were not necessarily Albert Finney's character, um, Daniel Feld, as Dennis Potter's memories. So Dennis Potter's wrapping up his own story um, of his public life. I just want to um, play this little clip here of an interview that he did uh, with Melvin Bragg, uh, where he talks about nowness and how important it is, because that's a thing that Bowie also brings into his work at the end of his life. I, mean, uh, I haven't shed a tear since uh, I knew. I, I grieve for the, my family and friends who, who know me 
process, obviously. Sure. Or, yeah. Not that I'm interested in reassuring people, you know, bugger that. The, the truth, the fact is that if you see the present tense, boy, do you see it. And boy, can you celebrate it, you know? So at the end of Bowie's career, he writes a true hymn to nowness called No Plan. It's all the things that are my life, my moods, my desires, right? Um, so let's have a little look at that video. Wonderful, wonderful song. Okay, I'm getting towards the end now, um, but I just wanted to bring this scary image on board here. Um, just because um, when I was looking at Lazarus, um, and I knew that Bowie was reading um, the Red Book, and I was also looking at dreams and dreams as theatre, um, all of this was leading me back to the Tibetan Buddha Book of the Dead, and also to um, Bowie's Buddhism. Um, which was quite explicitly stated at the end of his life. And um, I went back to this text. There is a version of this text where um, Carl Jung does this wonderful essay at the front, you know, presenting it as a great psychological work, the idea that the dreams sequence or the, you know, the, uh, the subconscious or unconscious self um, must have these quite elaborate psychedelic battles in order to achieve peace in death. This idea is something that I think has been brought through, or is at least a way of reading Lazarus, which I find quite a beautiful idea. Um, so in Lazarus, you have this moment of horror, um, which you know, and if you read the Book of the Dead, you realise that um, one of the bardos is you know of the wrathful ones. It's all about violence and horrible, horrible things happening. And in the musical, um, the horrible thing happens is that. Um, that is Newton, it's a terrible crop. That's Newton there with the knife being held by his shadow, um, Valentine, and he has to sever attachment to the thing that he, uh, the only thing that he wants to be attached to, which is this spectral image of his daughter. Um, and then when she dies, oh, I'm, I am spoiling it, I'm sorry. Uh, when she dies, he is distraught. Um, and this sort of milk or amniotic fluid, perhaps, um, uh, or blood, or she's an alien, alien blood, however you want to see it, um, seeps from under her body and fills the stage. Um, but in, my, in a reading, perhaps, that you might want to do where it is about um, the Bardo Thadol, it's about rebirth, it's about finding your rebirth, um, then what we could see happening here is um, potentially a hopeful, lovely idea of Newton finding his rebirth at the end of the musical. And so they're sort of slipping around. He's wet like a newborn, quite like it. Um, there's a version of the song at the end of the musical, uh, a version of Heroes, it's in the minor key. It's really subdued. There's an interesting story about the arrangement because uh, Evo and Ender really wanted Heroes for the finale. And um, Henry Hay told me a story that Bowie was just against it, and there was like some meeting they had, and um, Bowie and Coco were like, it's not happening, it's too triumphant, it's going to be like this flag waving thing at the end, and we don't want that, it's not that type of show. And Henry Hay, according to his story, said, all right, I'll come back to you, I've got an idea. And he went away and um, did an arrangement of heroes that was really subdued. Musically very interesting in the sense that the bass notes of the chords are never the root note, they're always something else. So it's, it sort of floats and it's precarious and it's sort of above the ground until the very end when it resolves and it resolves at the moment of death, which I think is a really lovely thing. So we're gonna watch the end of Lazarus again. I hope I don't get sued for this. <laughs> Okay, I think I'm going to end with that. I think that's a good place to end. Um, this is the very last thing I'm doing to promote my book. The book came out one year ago. And um, I've been, I don't know, speaking about it, talking about it. Um, but I'm really pleased and proud to um, be talking about it here in, in Dublin and also that so many of you came out to listen to me chat about it. 
It's really, really cool. So thank you so much for making my day. Thank you. <laughs>